Breath of Life presents Experience the Power with Walter L. Pearson Jr. Today, Pastor Pearson's message is entitled, They Crucified My Lord. I want to uh, let you know that this is one of the most beautiful sermons that I think I preach, but it's the most difficult one to do, because I don't know what you're going to feel, but every time... Every time I see him, when I see what he did for me, I can barely take it. So pray that I get through the sermon, but pray more that God will show us his son again. Would you pray with me, Father in heaven, today we would see Jesus. We recognize that he no longer hangs on a cross. Today, Jesus ministers as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. He's there when we pray. He's there when we have needs. He's there to forgive our sins. But today, we want to see him as he shed his blood for us. So as we open the word of God, let the spirit be with us. Let us be guided into all truth and I pray father that as I determine to speak the truth by the power of your Holy Spirit that every heart will recognize the truth and be changed by it this is my prayer in the name of Jesus amen it is important I believe to know why Jesus died I am not angry at uh, that motion picture that got everybody's mind focused again on Jesus. I sat there and uh, saw a few places where I would have done things differently. But since I didn't have the discretionary funds, I couldn't make the movie. I tell you what, I don't think it takes a movie to see it. I believe that God has arranged it so that if you understand why he died, and that, my friends, is my burden today not just that he died I think all of us are impressed with the pain that he suffered but if it was for nothing if if it was something he brought upon himself as I hear some theologians even say then what was it for but I dare to differ with them I believe that the central act of all eternity will be the death of Jesus on Calvary because it was not for him but for me that Jesus died and the first reason I suggest to you is found in Revelation chapter 20 some of you know that we go through texts fairly quickly I have these just about memorized but I'll find a few with you Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6 it says blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years the Bible speaks about the second death suggesting that there is a first death the first death is the kind of death that we see every day the second death is eternal death for those who refuse Jesus blood and its saving qualities so the first death is the result of sin many of us will die it does not mean that we are dying without Christ in fact I'm happy to announce today that you can live in Christ and die in Christ and if you die in Christ it's asleep it's asleep because you wake up when you hear the voice of Jesus those who are in their graves those who have come to know the name of Jesus and understand what the voice of Jesus sounds like will hear his voice in the tomb nobody else can be heard in the tomb the living know that they shall die the dead know not anything their love their hatred is perished they have not the power to hear until the life giver calls 
And when Jesus calls, even people who are dead will hear his voice and will rise. The same angel that ushered them to their graves will wait for them as they rise up in the power of divinity and will take them to meet with their Lord. I love the thought of it. What do you say? But there is a second death. People who die the second death will be resurrected quickly and die again at the brightness of his coming. And I suggest to you that the first reason that I want to share with you that Jesus died was so that I could avoid the second death. So today I, I know that I might die the first death. And I'm not afraid. I've already been in situations where I thought it was about to come. I shared one with you. I, I remember one time my wife and I were driving on a little narrow road in the, in the country. It was slippery and wet. We only had our daughter then. She was standing between us on the front seat of the car. Another car came out of its lane, ran into that big Buick we were driving, ripped it off at the firewall. Another car hit us from the back. I remembered that there was a chasm over to the right. I thought the second car would push us over. And all I had time to say was, Lord, help us. And when that car stopped, glass was everywhere. I remember that I had a big Afro hairstyle in those days. I was quite proud of it. Part of the car had touched my hair. Part of the car had touched my leg. My wife had just a tiny nick on her leg. Our child, our daughter, was sitting between us, glass all over us, but nothing had touched us. God is able. But in that moment before we were safe, I thought, if I must go, I want to just call Jesus one more time because if I die in him I'll rise again if Christ had not died every one of us would be susceptible not only to the first death but to the second I tell you today that we have hope because Jesus died on Calvary then we also have proof that the ceremonial law is ended we talked about how cumbersome they were there were laws that said you could only walk a certain distance on the Sabbath. You could only carry something about equal to a handkerchief. You couldn't do certain things. And even when you did what was lawful on the Sabbath, there would be somebody there to criticize you. Jesus came into conflict with these laws because he healed the sick on the Sabbath. That's proper for the Sabbath. Somebody today ought to take time to go visit someone. You ought to bring light to someone's life. You ought to tell them about the Jesus of the Sabbath. But the fact is that under the weight of those ceremonial laws, the Sabbath had become a burden. You had to sit there and think about what you could do and what you couldn't do. You couldn't have the joy of the Sabbath. And I tell you that God has created the Sabbath as a delight. In fact, if you delight yourself, in the Lord on the Sabbath, he will give you a particular brand of joy. There is a joy in communing with Jesus on the Sabbath that nobody else can have except those who believe what he says. And then he will magnify your joy. So I'm not talking about the east to west ubiquitous smiles that people have on commercials. I'm not talking about people trying to make themselves happy. I'm talking about the joy that springs up from inside when you know that God is in your life, that Jesus is the one who governs your activities. And when you can walk with him and talk with him, then you understand the joy of the Sabbath. But those laws also said that when I sinned, I had to take a sacrifice to the priest or to the temple. The priest would sometimes cut the lamb's throat or eventually even the sinner would cut the lamb's throat. Jesus understood and so every symbol in the ceremonial law pointed forward to the real sacrifice. One day when Jesus finally went to the cross, the priest was still there at the temple, knife in hand, a lamb about to die. But when Jesus declared, it is done, it is accomplished, the priest's hand began to tremble. The knife fell. The lamb leaped 
from that place and scampered away because the real Lamb of God had gone to the cross. So in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, you will read that, that there were laws that were nailed to Jesus' cross. It was not the Ten Commandments. The Bible says they last forever. They are holy, just, and good. They are the perfect law of liberty. They last forever till heaven and earth pass away. One dotting of an I or crossing of a T will not pass from the law of God until all is accomplished. So it was the ceremonial law that was nailed to the cross. The law that Deuteronomy 31, 24 says that Moses wrote with his own hand. The Bible says that the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God. Well, let me pause just a moment to say this. One of my favorite preachers pointed out that, that when Jesus writes law, he writes it in stone. I'm writing backwards, it's Hebrew. <laughs> Only the finger of Jesus could write in stone. So when Jesus writes law, he writes it in stone. But one day there was a group that came to accuse a woman caught in adultery. On that day, Jesus wrote on the floor of the temple in dust. He wrote the unconfessed sins of those who had brought this woman. And when he had finished writing, they had all gone. So today, I declare to you that when Jesus writes law, he writes it in stone so you can't forget it. But even if he were to write your sin, he would only write it in dust. So that when you confess them and forsake them, he can say, blow them away. That's the power of my Jesus. So Jesus goes to the cross so that I can enjoy the Sabbath. And I do. If you see me on a Sabbath and wonder why I'm happy, it's because I'm told to be happy. The Sabbath brings joy. It's a delight. And I thank God for it. I have an extra 52 vacation days per year. Huh? So if you haven't had a vacation, recognize God's holy Sabbath. You'll get 52 vacation days and they come just in time. Just as you are about to go slowly out of your mind. The Sabbath comes. It's not a time to go to sleep and stay asleep. It's time to commune with God. And the only question you need to ask on the Sabbath is, does it honor God? And if it honors God, then it's worthy of doing on God's holy Sabbath. Then Jesus went to the cross to show that the commandments are forever binding. There are some people who think that Jesus did away with law. And my question is simple. If he did away with law, why did he die? If law was expunged, then Jesus need never have come to the earth. If I knew what heaven looked like completely and had lived there, why would I choose to come here? Not a bad place in some spaces. Some of you live in very nice houses. Write me a note, invite me over. I know how to behave myself in nice houses. But I'll tell you already, your house is nothing compared to God's house. I don't care where you live. Your house is nothing compared to the house you're going to have when God takes you to his place where there are resting places, dwelling places that are permanently mine. In fact, one of the beauties of my home there will be that you can't take it away. No taxes, no mortgage, no rental payments. <laughs> so, so if he came, and let's, let's, let's go quickly. I, I need to look these up, but let me move. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 4 says, The soul that sinneth, shall die the greatest lie that satan ever told was the one he said disguised as a snake he said to eve you shall not surely die 
God had said, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you do away with the last part, pardon me, if you do away with the first part of that text, wages of sin is death, you don't need the last part, gift of God, eternal life. If there is no law, if there is no death for sin, then why do you need Jesus to give you eternal life? You already have it. I suggest to you by deductive reasoning, this text proves that the law is still standing. Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law. Matthew chapter five, starting with verse 17, he says, I came to establish the law. So Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, but not by throwing out the rule book. He came to shed his blood, for in his blood there is power to remit sin. So the death on Calvary establishes that the law of God is still binding. The law is there. Then somebody says, does God really love me if he allows me to work under law? And my answer is real simple. God had to have rules. The problem today is that we live in a lawless society. I don't want to talk about people in our parking lot right here. I don't want to talk long. But it's amazing to me how some people are very law abiding until they want to get close. At your home, you have a treadmill. You bought it so you could walk. But then you get to a place like this and you don't want to walk anymore. You want to park just beside the door. So people become lawless. They fly into parking spaces when they see somebody else coming, rushing to hear the word of God. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. I need to read this one. It's powerful. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Here's what the Bible says. But God commendeth his love towards us, toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The fact is that while you were still a gleam in your father's eye before you were born, Jesus knew that you would be born a sinner, but he died for you anyway. So he proves his love that he keeps rules, but that he dies for us so that we can be set free by his blood. Then someone says, how about this? If God is omniscient, if he knows everything, and I believe he does, then God knew before man was created that man would sin and that the wages of sin would be death. So why would God make us in the first place if he knew we would sin and be guilty and punishable by death. Isaiah chapter 53 is where I'd like to take you because I posit to you today that Isaiah 53 proves that we will be in better shape after sin and Christ than we were before. Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, why don't we start reading at about verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed so whatever sin inflicts upon us whatever the death penalty might have inside of it Jesus by his sacrificial death on Calvary takes it all away in fact I believe that he not only takes it away but places us in a new position 
so that no longer are we just servants of God but we are adopted by faith into the family of God when we surrender our lives when we are born again we are not born back into the same family with all of the same family traits but now we are born into the family of God so Jesus becomes my elder brother and I am no longer just a servant but I am now in the family in fact my record is not worthy to get me into heaven but Jesus wipes my record clean and puts his there because all of my righteousnesses are like filthy rags so I have his record instead of mine then in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 you must know that there is another gift Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says this in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace there is no reason why anybody in the family ought to carry sin because our redemption has been accomplished through the death of Christ on Calvary now once you understand in fact Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 22 asks is there no balm in Gilead <laughs> is there no medication for my disease I've got a disease that the physicians don't quite comprehend because it's not a physiological disease it is a disease in my soul it was sown there both by my genetics and my acculturation I am born in sin and shaped in iniquity it came through my Punit Square it came through my family tree but it also came by how I live and the question is can you find a medicine that will take that away and according to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 almost all things are by blood cleansed almost all things and without blood there is no remission I tell you today that I was born with the cancer of sin and I hope that there's some cancer survivor listening to me because I, I thank God for what's happening in your life I'm glad that God has power over cancer I'm glad that God has power over physical diseases and you are happy to hear that word remission but listen Jesus also has power over sin and when you take into your life the blood of Jesus there's power in the blood and blood the blood of Jesus puts my sin into remission I praise God for it now let me share with you if you will what the American Medical Association was inclined to do I was shocked when I saw it because this this august group of physicians rarely looks at anything in the religious realm it's too risky but I picked up an article sent to me by a friend a friend who knew that if I saw it I would preach at least one sermon on it and the physicians began to explain what they saw in the death of Jesus they began if you will in Luke chapter 22 you must know that Dr. Luke the physician was there with Jesus from beginning almost to the end Luke chapter 22 the Bible has to say here that there were certain physiological signs that Jesus was in trouble as he began to face the specter of Calvary verse 44 and being in agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground the physician starts by saying that this phenomenon called hematidrosis is when blood hemorrhages into the tiny blood vessels of the body so that instead of perspiration coming through the pores as normal 
blood mingles in the vessels with perspiration so that when the face begins to have droplets on it they are not clear droplets they are bloody droplets so even in Gethsemane having gone through that last supper you remember when they began to dip into the into that little sauce that they shared the herbs and there was one hand that came down with Christ's remember who it was it was one Iscariot yeah. Judas and he dipped in Jesus locked eyes with him and the question didn't have to be spoken but it was Jesus had walked for months and years trusting in these 12 but one of them thought he was so worldly wise that he could go make a deal with the enemies of Christ. Some scholars believe that he thought if he pushed Jesus into a situation which was impossible, Jesus would have to show his power. Jesus doesn't need your help to be God. And so he sold his master, took those pieces of silver, and as Jesus looked into his eyes, in fact, one of my favorite writers says that the moment that was most telling was when Jesus went to wash the disciples' feet. There was no servant that day when they went to the upper room. There should have been, but there wasn't. No disciple was humble enough to get on his knees and wash anybody's feet. So Jesus took the towel and knelt down and washed their feet. You remember Peter said no, but when Jesus said, look, if you don't let me do that, you can't make it. He said, then wash my feet and my head, wash me all over. You can talk about Peter if you want to, but he knew how to make an adjustment midstream. Some of us are so proud that we will never change. Join us next time for more of Pastor Pearson's message entitled, They Crucified My Lord. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did something especially for you. He got up on a cross at Calvary and died. That day, you were on his mind. Our offer this week is Max Lucado's He Did This Just For You. This easy-to-read, entertaining, and inspiring book reveals what God did to win your heart. Let Max Lucado beautifully lay out the way home to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Call today and ask for He Did This Just For You. It's yours for a gift of $5 or more. The toll-free number is 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. Or you may ask for the book by writing to Breath of Life, Post Office Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. Remember to include your gift of $5 or more. Come up close and personal with the passion and promise of God Almighty in He Did This Just For You. Breath of Life presents Experience the Power with Walter L. Pearson, Jr. Join us now as Pastor Pearson continues his message entitled, They Crucified My Lord. Jesus comes now to the feet of Judas and takes his foot in his hand. And that writer favorite of mine says that a shock went up his leg. And there he felt the love of Christ. Not an electric shock. It was a love shock. And when it came to his heart and to his head, he didn't know what to do. And so he fought because had he not fought, he would have surrendered and his plans would have changed. Because when Jesus touches you, even your feet, something changes inside him. He had to fight it off. And he was in danger of being saved 
until he got up. And let me tell you something. I want to be straight with you. Jesus will come and touch every one of you. He'll do it before this sermon is over. And you've got a choice. You can let him keep his hands on you. And his touch will change you. Or you can pull away. The only way you'll be able to resist him is to get up and walk away. Because if you stay where Jesus is, I promise you that nothing will be the same. He has that power. So, so Jesus is in Gethsemane. The disciples look at him and he frightens them. They have never seen anything like it. There are dots of blood on his face. That face that they loved to behold. And they wonder what's wrong. But presently, you know, there wasn't much time between those moments and when the guards came. And they came and Judas went to put a, a kiss. What a terrible kiss. There are Christians who kiss like that. And as Jesus went up and allowed him to kiss, the soldiers came and took him. Peter takes out his sword. Sometimes Peter does exactly what I think I would have done. <laughs> and if you think Peter was aiming at that God's ear, You don't understand Peter. Peter missed. I think he was headed for right about here. He missed and got an ear. And even in the midst of his trial, Jesus puts the ear back. Nobody pays much attention to that. But even when you are against him, even when you have sold him out, even when you come to arrest him, even when you are about to accomplish his death, Jesus is still in healing mode. He does it that way. Now here is what happens, let's, let's look carefully. The fact is that Jesus goes from one judge to another. He went first to the Jewish judges, Annas, Caiaphas, then the religious Sanhedrin. From one o'clock in the morning to sunrise, he walks from one courthouse to another, but there's not one right sentence issued. In fact, at sunrise, he is probably at the political Sanhedrin where they convict him again of blasphemy. When he was convicted by the religious Sanhedrin, here is what the leaders of the Jewish church did. They put on him symbols that represented kingship. Then they blindfolded him. They filled their mouths with saliva and spat on him. Then with their fists, they beat his face, trying their best to dis disfigure him. Because even with all of their power, they couldn't take anything from him. He was more powerful under their presumed power than he ever was. So he already had one beating when they turned him loose. And when he went to the political Sanhedrin, they convicted him again. Now he comes to those, those Roman judges. He goes first to Pontius Pilate, who says, no, I, it's nothing wrong with him. They take him to Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. And this man says, well, I don't know what to do. And finally, when the crowd continues to scream, and, and you must listen to me, never, never trust the majority. You got to find out what the majority is doing. There are some people who spend their lives following the majority. Everything they do, they check the wind to see which way the majority is going. Too many politicians check the wind to see which way the wind is blowing when right ought to be the sign that you follow. But when he could find nothing wrong, the people in their crowd began to chant, crucify, crucify. There is every reason to believe that the devil mingled imps in the crowd, distributed devils, demons in the crowd, and they were the ones who precipitated the chant. Can you see some wrinkled-faced imp starting quietly? Crucify. 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 And here are people who claim to know God, who begin to chant what they hear instead of what they know. The curse of God's people 
is not so much the devil. We know what he's going to do. It's people who claim to be God's people who chant things because they hear it. So the chant begins to spread. And all of a sudden, even the leaders of the Jewish church are crying out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And in order to make the people go away, this, this terrible Roman judge says, do what you will. I wash my hands of it, but take him. Now comes the problem. The scourging was death. It was not the cross. It was the scourge. The fact is that this was accomplished by people who were known as lictors. They would have something that was, had a handle and, and unequal lengths of leather, sometimes twined or braided, sometimes just simply hanging on their own. In the ends of some of those leather lengths were iron balls to give weight to that scourge then there were broken teeth of sheep in other lengths so that when the iron balls gave weight the teeth would cut into the skin they would hang the person who was about to be scourged tie him at the top of a of a long wooden distance and strip him of all of his clothes then either one or two lictors would take turns making an inverted V on his back. So one would come down this way on this side of his back going down. The other would come down this way on the other side of his back going down. They would start at the nape of the neck and come all the way past the buttocks, cutting open the skin with the scourge. They were supposed to only do it 39 times, but even the Bible says, that they would go further than this because they wanted the life of this man who claimed so much power, claimed to be the son of God. So on the second time that they came by, these terrible leather lengths went underneath the skin that had been cut. And they started going into the skeletal muscles. They would pull flesh from underneath the cut skin so that when they came down the second time coming down the same way in the same wounds the flesh of the son of god was torn away and then he was left at a moment when he was almost dead but here's my experience the power moment the bible says with his stripes oh how i love jesus for he stood there and let him do it because he knew every time they hit him there was a fountain filled with blood being filled up a reservoir of healing power so that no matter how deep my sin may be, every time they put a scar on his back, they gave more power to save me from my sin with his stripes. I am healed. I'm sorry that they beat my Jesus like that, but I'm glad I am healed by the stripes they put on his back. Every time the devil says, that I can't make it. I point back to the stripes. I say I'm healed by the stripes you put on him. So you were dumb to do what you did. Because you filled up a fountain. And today I am saved by his blood and by his stripes. What they had done before they had taken those two to four inch those those thorns twined them together put them on his head remember that his skin was already fragile and thin blood had already oozed through it 
they pressed it down on his head. And then they took the stick that they put in his hand as a scepter and beat it on his thorns. Drove them deeper into the skin of his face. He was already stained by blood that had oozed through his skin because of the trauma of the suffering. Now the thorns dig into his skin. And then they take him from that place, wrap a garment around him, taunt him, spit on him, beat him. Dogs ran beside him. And as they ran, they talked about his parentage. Somebody made a cruel joke about his mother who claimed that she had a virgin birth. And I don't know the names that they might have called him in their language. But what they said was, you don't really have a daddy. Can you imagine what God must have felt? They're telling his son he doesn't have a daddy. God could have grabbed the earth and hurled it somewhere. But because God so loved the world, he allowed it to continue. So now, having wrapped Jesus again, they put upon him the cross. There is dissension now. I know most of you have seen the movie. I finally saw it. And I know that they have the tall cross completely on the back of Jesus. The American Medical Association disagrees. They say that the, uh, the vertical part of the cross was in place. And that it was only the patibulum, the horizontal part of the cross, that weighed from 75 to 125 pounds that they bent him over and put it across his neck. And then tied his hands to it. Let me tell you. If Jesus could have stopped being human, he would have walked that thing forever. He'd ask him, where's the rest of the cross? Is this all you got? But he could not carry the cross as God. He had to carry it as a man. He had had a ministry that involved walking, so Jesus was in great physical condition. Everywhere he went, he walked. In fact, from 9 o'clock on Thursday night to 9 o'clock on Friday morning, he had gone without food, without water, without sustenance, and he had only been betrayed and, and beaten, and, and everything that you can imagine had happened to him. And, and this is the human being upon whom they put this, this, this patibulum. And humanity carries it for a long time, attesting to his physical fitness. Yes. There are some people who see Jesus as some wispy little genderless figure. It's not my Jesus. I, I believe that when they put it on him, his muscles rippled. He had worked with his father in a carpenter shop. He did not make bird houses. They carried the wood from one place to another, sometimes over two hours just to get to the place where they worked. And then they built houses. So when you saw Jesus walk, you did not see somebody who looked like he was vulnerable. In fact, every man who could have seen Jesus, if it had not been that God did not want his physical appearance to draw us, if God had not made it so that we did not become drawn by his physical appearance, Jesus would have been so muscular that every man would have wanted to be like him. He would have been so handsome that every woman would have swooned when she saw him. But he's, he's, in Isaiah it says he had no form of comeliness. God didn't want you to follow Jesus because of what it looked like. He wanted you to follow him because of his love. So he was built so that you didn't follow him because of that. However, I'm telling you that he carried that thing until human power could do no more. That was this black man. I apologize to everyone who cannot take immediate pride in the fact that he's black. Just come on and experience the power anyway. I 
I posit to you that if Simon had looked weak, they would never have chosen him. So he must have been a real black man. Let's listen, listen, listen. It takes a real man to be able to express sensitivity. If you have questions about your gender, you can never shed a tear. You can never be touched. You got to always be strong and macho. But if you're a real man, you can, if you cry, you're still a man. It's a man, right? If you show sympathy, you're still a man. So this man showed sympathy, and the Roman soldiers saw it. And they saw he was powerfully built, no doubt, and saw that he had, was in sympathy. So that you, come here. He didn't volunteer. Let's don't, let's don't make it better than it is. But they called him, and Simon carries the cross. And when he, when he carries it, it changes him. You can't carry the cross and stay the same. There's reason to believe that his whole family was changed because he bore the cross. And Jesus is taken to the place called Golgotha. There they, they take his garments, rip them off his back. The blood has cemented the cloth to his back. So it, they tear it off. They throw him down on the ground so that now the dirt, the blood-stained dirt of Golgotha, where many have died and their dried blood is caked in the earth. So there's no reason to think that every de diseased particle, everything that could bring him illness is there and they press him down and stretch him his hands those hands that had touched fevered brows and the fever disappeared those hands that had mingled spittle with clay and just put it on somebody's eye and the man says i can see but it's not real clear he said let me get one more time he puts it on again and says, I, I see i see clearly now those hands that had touched that funeral beer you remember that widow who came out with her son? Jesus and his crowd met them. One crowd shouting for joy, one crowd mourning for sadness. And all of a sudden the cacophony of sound comes together. Jesus stops all the noise. Those same hands go over and say, lady, let me take care of this. And he touches that dead boy and he gets up. So now the two crowds are making the same noise because the funeral has been turned into a shouting brigade and they all sing the praises of Jesus together. Those hands, those hands, they stretch now. There's every reason to believe that the Romans had physicians to find the place. It was not according to the American Medical Association in the palm. I really, I, I don't have a problem. It doesn't matter where they put the nail. It just matters that he died. They say it was here. They say that the physicians from the Romans would find the exact place where the median nerve was. The median nerve, when touched and traumatized, radiates a burning sensation up the arm and into the chest and they put it there a five to seven inch square cut spike and they beat it next to the median nerve if it severs the median nerve the hand will be forced into paralysis like a claw so it could be that the hand of Jesus the median nerve being severed was paralyzed into a claw like place but they stretched him there. Then they take his feet and put them together on top of each other and pound the spike there. They go to a nerve in the feet. And then they pull that thing up and drop him. 
there is. The doctors say that hanging on that cross, insects would find the places in the back that were cut open and begin to burrow into the wounds. They would get around his eyes and burrow into his eyes. He could feel the pain of insects that had been made by his own hand, burrowing now into his own flesh, but he could not wipe them away. In fact, even when they offered him an analgesic, wine and gall, he put it away because he knew that unless he drank the dregs of suffering, he could not save Walter Pearson. And so he would not accept the painkiller because he had to save me. Now let me move quickly because here is, I think, the worst part. There are many, there are many things said about how he died. But here's what I believe. One of the things that happened was when he was hung on the cross, legs twisted, weight on his hands. His diaphragm is pulled up. So the problem with breathing is that he can't exhale easily. So his, breath his breathing is shallow. In order to exhale, he's got to push up. In fact, some people died on the cross because they could never exhale. So they were asphyxiated. Asphyxiated by not being able to breathe. And if Jesus said anything from the cross, like, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And even when he came to the very end. Into thy hand. I commend my spirit. And at three in the afternoon. On an ugly Friday. His head fell and the Roman guards came to break his legs to make sure he was dead. They saw that he was gone. A six foot spear was plunged into his side. Water and blood came out. And here's what the doctors say. It was either from hypovolemic shock, which means you don't have enough blood. Blood is too low. And your heart struggles to find enough blood to pump. Or it's some strange arrhythmia that is the heart's reaction trying to save you. So it's either that he has hypovolemic shock or exhaustion asphyxia. But the blood and the water say that it could have been some intervening instant event that caused him to die in three to six hours instead of the days that he could have stayed there because the Jewish leaders wanted to take him down before the Sabbath came. So some physicians say that it may have been a rupture of the heart. A heart rupture that would have allowed pleural fluid from the lungs to seep into the pericardial sac or that the heart itself produced water because of its trauma and when that spear went in blood and water came out signifying that it was his heart that broke for you if I were God And I saw my daughter, my firstborn, in an electric chair, in a gas chamber, lying on a gurney where you would put into her veins some poison that would kill her. If I had the power to save her, even if you would die, my daughter would get up. Because that's how I love her. If my son were about to be executed, even if you would die, my son would be saved because that's my son. But God loved you so much 
that God and all the holy angels put on darkness like overcoats gathered darkness to them and met down at the cross so God the Father and all the holy angels dressed in darkness came not to take Jesus down he had to die in my place so God didn't come to snatch him from the cross he just came to stand with him as he died in my place because it was God's intent also that I died. Thanks for watching. Join us next time for more Breath of Life with Pastor Walter L. Pearson Jr. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did something especially for you. He got up on a cross at Calvary and died. That day, you were on his mind. Our offer this week is Max Lucado's He Did This Just For You. This easy-to-read, entertaining, and inspiring book reveals what God did to win your heart. Let Max Lucado beautifully lay out the way home to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Call today and ask for He Did This Just For You. It's yours for a gift of $5 or more. The toll-free number is 877-BOL-OFFER. That's 877-265-6333. Or you may ask for the book by writing to Breath of Life, Post Office Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. Remember to include your gift of $5 or more. Come up close and personal with the passion and promise of God Almighty in He Did This Just For You.